All right. This is the group project for Fire Protection Technologies 103 at Miramar College. Our presentation today focuses on the fire that devastated the Our Lady of Angels School in Chicago in 1958 due to the failings and absence of fire suppression, protection, and detection equipment. Our group members are David Shanley, Anthony Stuckey, Daniel Noble, and Earl Winston. I'd like to give a quick overview before we cover the finer points of the presentation. First is that this tragedy took place on December 1st in 1958 in Chicago, Illinois during the early afternoon. This was the deadliest school fire in American history, claiming the lives of 95 individuals. The loss of life and overall damage caused by the fire was largely due to the school's lack of fire suppression and detection equipment, as stated earlier, as well as failings to have many of the modern NFPA construction standards and regulations. On top of these problems, there were personal issues and failings of standard fire safety practices by the staff of the school that led to more unneeded casualties. Fortunately from this tragedy, many safety regulations and reforms would sweep through Chicago and the United States as a whole. I'd also like to quickly cover the school building's layout and construction. Starting with the North Wing, which was constructed in 1910 as a church and was later renovated to house a school and classrooms. The South Wing was a building which was already an existing structure next to the North Wing and was later converted into classrooms as well in 1949. The two buildings were then later connected by a brick annex, which gave the structure its unique U shape, which is right here. The North Wing was made up of two stories, along with an English style basement that sinks about four and a half feet into the foundation. The exterior of both the North and the South Wing buildings was of masonry construction while the inside consisted primarily of combustible materials, materials such as wooden floors, stairs, furniture, and even wooden blackboards, along with flammable wax coatings on the floor, children's coats hanging in the main corridor, and cellulose fiber acoustic tiles on the ceiling. This photo of the school's classroom interior gives a good example of not only how much combustible materials were available, but also how many children were in any given classroom at the time of the fire. Moving on to the fire, it was reported to have started between 1400 to 1420 hours in a cardboard trash barrel at the foot of the northeast stairwell in the basement. The basement was where the school had a paper waste disposable incinerator, so there is a very likely cause as to what most likely started the fire or probably caused the fire. The fire would burn undetected and unimpeded for an estimated 15 to 30 minutes, gradually filling the stairwell with superheated gases and smoke, causing the stairwell to act like a makeshift chimney. One factor in this initial situation that could be seen as a good and bad thing is that the, fire, is that the first floor landing in the stairwell was equipped with a thick wooden door, which was able to keep out most of the heat and smoke from the first floor. While this was beneficial, it did cause the fire to go unnoticed for longer. The second floor landing had no such door or any door at all, allowing fire, heat, and smoke to travel easily while this was happening. Or, no, while this was happening, the fire was finally noticed and reported on when two children told their teacher they smelled smoke after coming back from the boiler room in the basement. By the time the students and their teachers in the second floor classrooms realized there was a fire, their sole escape route, the center hallway, was all but impassable. Another issue was that a pipe chase that ran from the basement to the cock loft above the second floor ceiling gave the superheated gases a direct route to the attic, where the temperature rapidly rose, reaching ignition temperatures. The flames coming from the basement and the flames in the cock loft swept through the halls and ceiling of the second floor in the north wing, the flames breaking windows as it spread, which only gave it more fuel and gave the flames more strength. Um, in response to the fire, um, while the occupants of the first floor of the north wing were able to escape relatively unharmed, the same could not be said for the second floor. Many children and a few of the adults were jumping from the windows 
all the way to the hard gravel below to escape from the deadly flames. When fire crews arrived, they did everything they could to combat the flames while trying to help the occupants fleeing to safety. The, when the fire was officially knocked down, there were over 74 different rescue units that were involved with this fire. 22 uh, fire companies, seven ladder companies, and a myriad of other individuals. Now, the main reason why this fire was so devastating was the lack thereof of fire suppression, detection, and protection systems, such as, and some of these were controllable and others weren't, mainly being that the building where the fire began was constructed many years ago and was lacking many modern NFPA regulations and standards at the time. Um, one of which was all of the buildings lacked fire sprinkler systems, which would have helped slow down the fire, or at least control it long enough for more people to escape. There were only two manual fire alarms in the building where the fire originated. These alarms were only internal light type alarms. Um, they were unmarked and only alerted the occupants of the building, never sending a message alert to the fire department. This is where personal issues came about because after reading through articles, only certain members of the staff of the church and the school were allowed to pull the alarms, which only let the fire progress longer. There were also no fire alarm or pull boxes on the exterior of the school building, which would have helped because many occupants outside of the building saw the fire, but had no way of alerting those inside the building. For a bizarre reason, the fire alarms, which there were only two of in the south wing building, there were none in the north, and the forex fire extinguishers that were inside the school building were placed at elevated heights. Reports say that the fire alarms were six feet off the ground and the extinguishers were even higher than that at around eight, leaving them almost impossible to reach. The response from the firefighters was met with difficulties as well. First by arriving at the wrong destination due to incorrect directions. And second was that they had to forcibly enter the courtyard by bashing down a locked iron gate. The school at the time of the fire was at and went above its estimated capacity. Over 1,200 to 1,300 students were inside when the fire began. This number severely exceeded the limit of the building's exit codes, or NFPA 101. There was only one fire escape for the building at the time as well, which was commented on and critiqued by a fire inspector sometime well before the fire, but no changes were made due to the building, have, due to the building having grandfather clauses that made um, renovations all but impossible. The stairwells, like mentioned before, were also a large contributor to the loss of life and worsening of the fire. At the time, the Illinois building codes required that all stairwells in schools be enclosed. Of the five stairwells that were inside the schoolhouse, only two of which were enclosed. Um, another thing was the smoke had no way of escaping from the building, so it flowed through the vent systems that ran through the school without being impeded, as explained before again. So the aftermath of this devastating fire was that many schools in Chicago were inspected and required to install sprinkler systems, fire rated doors, and start using more non-combustible materials. New fire alarm boxes would be installed that could be pulled from outside the building that would activate alarms inside, and they would send alert to the fire department as well. Firefighters for a time would inspect residential and school areas during class hours for added safety, and reforms of the NFPA standard in schools and construction were widely enforced. More focus was put on the safety and accessibility of exit doors and capacity, and many schools throughout the country started replacing wood and plaster construction with concrete. And from this time, the impact, the, the casualty rates of school fires or any such disasters has dropped tremendously. Here are our sources. Thank you.